it's Mike with Ubitastic. I'm here at RailsConf 2014, and I'm standing here with Coraline Emke, who gave a talk called Artisans and Apprentices. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with me. Of course. So can you tell me a little bit about your presentation? Sure. Um, I've been involved with onboarding new developers, with bringing new people into our field for a number of years now, through mentorships, through training, through education, by being a teacher's assistant. And I really think that it's one of the most important problems that we have to solve right now as technologists, is how to bring new people into our community while preserving our community values and making sure that they have the appropriate resources to become effective and happy with their careers. Okay, yeah, because I, I, I worked with the uh, uh, talent at uh, group on and so I'm familiar with some of what you're talking about, uh, some of those things that you're dealing with when, when you're onboarding an employee mm -hmm. can be a huge uh, indicator of whether they're going to stick around. Right, and uh, I think actually even before they come into their first job, the work that we do as a community to prepare them for entering the workforce, mm -hmm. um, whether they go through a boot camp program, whether they go through a CS program, or if they're self-taught, um, the way that we present ourselves to them, we establish a baseline for what our expectations for them are. I think that's something we have to be very deliberate about. So when you say expectations, are you talking about strictly technical or maybe cultural or both? Is it Absolutely both. Um, our culture will erode. The things that bring us to a particular open source community, whether it be Ruby or Python or what have you, um, is the, the image that the um, community portrays mm -hmm. and that the way that it lives, the values that it, that it professes to hold dear. Mm -hmm. um, if we're not very deliberate about passing those values on, that cultural little road, and the things that we love about a community will slowly go away. So, uh, things like uh, RailsConf having the uh, no harassment policy, those are important things, or or is our, maybe I'm drifting a little bit from the, or I should say, are, are they imparting lessons to people who are apprentices or artisans coming to RailsConf and saying, wow, RailsConf has this thing that's obviously even if it's subconscious, it's it's imparting that this is important. To Actually, me. I never made that connection before, but I'm really glad you bring it up because I do work a lot with conferences and with people who work with conferences mm -hmm. to establish good codes of conduct. Um, what these are, uh, in my talk I talk about the fact that um, a boot camp situation where your pay, you, you don't work for 12 weeks and you, you pay them $12,000, that draws from a very privileged class of people who can afford um, to not have um, a wage for that mm -hmm. time, who can afford 12 grand, who don't have families to support and so on. And uh, I think that um, that, that self-selects people who are of a, of a privileged class. Mm -hmm. And in order to attract people who are different from uh, the, the, the majority of software developers, people who are maybe from outside of your community, outside of your network, mm -hmm. it's important to signal to them that they're welcome. And I think codes of conduct is one, uh, they're one mechanism by which you can signal to women and minorities and people of color and people on the LGBT spectrum that it's a safe place and that they're welcome and that there are um, consequences for people who violate the community norms. So you're you're here and you're presenting um, at Rails Confidence. So it sounds like you have you do feel comfortable here and you feel like it's it's giving a positive vibe. Um, is this something you, you've seen other conferences adopting, or is this something that maybe some conferences are kind of, well, uh, I'm not going to do this because maybe I'll upset our core audience? I absolutely have seen that uh, that, that play out, that discussion play out. Um, and uh, I took the Code of Conduct pledge that Ash Dryden put together mm -hmm. um, late last year. I will not speak at or attend a conference that does not have a comprehensive Code of Conduct. Okay. Um, and a lot of people took that pledge. Um, the people who disagree with it uh, or who don't think it's a big deal or not the people at the Code of Conduct is there for. Yeah. So uh, if I'm somebody who's working in a community and I have a youth group or a conference, uh, what are some of the things that I can do to be more aware or, or, or ensure that I'm not even unaware of them, uh, excluding people? I mean, if I look out at my, my user group and it's all a bunch of middle-aged white guys, is it just that's the area I'm in, or am I maybe doing something that, how can I become more aware of, of what I'm doing and evaluate whether or not the audience is just, that's the demographic I'm in, mm -hmm. or is there something I'm maybe doing to put up a barrier? I think that is absolutely the first step, is looking out at the people that you're associating with, and if they all look like you, there's a good chance that you're suffering from network mm -hmm. effect. Um, you have established relationships with people that you've worked with, people that you socialize with. Mm -hmm. um, it's not that you've done something wrong, it's that you haven't done all 
the things that you could do to make your group inclusive and welcoming. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the ways you can do that is by promoting the fact that you are open and welcoming. Um, you can reach out specifically to people that you know in the community um, who are you know people of color, who are women, who are people in the LGBT spectrum, who are um, you know not able-bodied like you are. Um, reaching out to them and making sure that they understand that you are open to their participation and you welcome their participation um, is an important first step. But there are people who are much more well-informed about these topics yeah. than I am. Um, I recommend going to Geek Feminism Wiki, and there are lots of re lots of resources there so for the answering some of those questions. Geek Feminism Wiki? Yeah, you can just Google okay. Geek Feminism Wiki, and they have lots of resources. And does that does that include information for people who are other abled and and yes, okay, yes. So it's, it's, it's intersectional. More, okay, yeah. And um, uh, you know, going even beyond. Um, uh, you know the current Rails uh, kind of conference uh, in a company where they're dealing with trying to recruit the most competent people. Mm -hmm. How can they? Do you, do you have any advice on how they can work with within these these frameworks or these? One of the ideas? techniques that has been shown to be effective is removing names and all identifying information from resumes as they mm -hmm. come in. Um, there have been studies that have shown that. Um, men and women um, are more likely to pick resumes that belong to um, people with male sounding names right. or people who um, don't have uh, a name that sounds Latino or European or like you know, uh, Polish or what have you. Right. Um, we tend to favor and pick people who remind us of us. Okay. So um, a blind selection process is very good. That's also a great way for picking speakers at conferences. Um, so just, just topic and, yeah. Yeah, and it doesn't Evaluate. sound like it would be a good talk. Right, exactly. Yeah. And then you can like it further, um, further down the process. You can say, "Oh, what has this person done before? And what other talks have they given? And so that could be the right flavor for our conference." Mm -hmm. And you do the same sort of thing with your company. Like everything that you do as an employer, um, the way that you post your job ad, where you post your job ad, um, the sorts of events that you sponsor, um, the marketing materials you have, the message around that. These are all expressions of your values. Your culture is not a ping pong table. It's not a foosball right. table or beer after work. Your culture is what you believe in as a group of people and how you express it. Yeah, and it's it's also going to, you know, I, I might fit into the, the uh, cultural class of the, the typical white male, but even when I see a ping pong table at a company, I I have three kids. Right. That's not appealing to me. Right. And that, that's, that's immediately a barrier, and I feel that between me and, and I, I think there's also an empathy thing mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, sure, you know, I, I'm not, maybe not somebody who who's experienced severe um, uh, challenges culturally, but I can extrapolate from that. It's like, oh, I feel complicated there. Well, maybe that other person who is not able to, you know, go up the stairs like mm -hmm. I can, might feel like, oh, they're not comfortable coming to a company that is up on the 15th right. floor. Yeah, I think you hit on something important. So empathy is very, very important. Mm -hmm. um, if we're thoughtful and empathetic, um, then, we, then we try to put ourselves in another's position um, and not express our opinions about what that must be like, but listen to what it's like yeah. um, and figure out a way to to advocate and be a good ally. It really comes down to listening and empathizing. Yeah, and you know, we did go a little bit off from your original yeah. talk. I, I kind of went off in a different direction. Okay. I apologize about that, but uh, so just to go back to artisans and, and apprentices, what was what was the the message, the story that you were telling the talk? Sure, um, the period of time that we live in, where we have um, market economies that are taking off, where we have periods in which people are moving from rural areas to cities, population explosion, um, an age of specialization as opposed to generalists. All of that happened before um, in medieval Europe, mm -hmm. um, and between the you know eleventh, twelfth, thirteenth centuries. Um, so we are not in a unique position. And the way that people then reacted to changing cultural and market, uh, market and governmental forces can um, teach us a lot about how we can react in a more effective way. There were things that we did that they did better than we did. Yeah. Um, if you were an apprentice in a guild, you had health insurance, essentially. Your master was required by law, um, required by the legal agreement that you signed um, to provide you with health care, with food um, and room and board. Um, and we don't do that for people who are entering a profession now. If you go to work for a startup, you're lucky if there's insurance. Right. And again, that self-selects people who can afford insurance or don't need insurance. Right. So, so uh, yeah, that's interesting to think 
about how uh, you know we, we like to think it was everybody for themselves or kind of thrown to the wolves back in those days, but it really wasn't. I remember even hearing about like in Egypt um, the, that there's was, there was controversy about whether the people that built the pyramids were slaves right. and that they were tradesmen mm-hmm. and they were actually like kind of like the middle class, mm-hmm. you know, like lower middle class, and they went and they built it, they worked for a period of time, and then they went back and then they had they were paid, mm-hmm. you know, so, you know, we, we think that we're so civilized now, but, and that everybody back then was so uncivilized, and, you know, it's... Civilization is not a linear progression, right. it's a cycle. Yeah, so, well, anyway, thank you for taking the time thank to you. speak, I appreciate it. I really appreciate the opportunity. User groups with lots to say, interviews and more. No way. Sharing great ideas in the tech community. Fascinating conversations, a plethora of information. Find out for yourself today at ugtastic.com.